all aboard. The Sun King is a cruise ship. It is sailing around the Caribbean. There are a lot of tourists on the ship. Most of them are from the United States, but some of them are from Canada and Latin America. It's the seventh day of the cruise, and their ship is sailing from Venezuela to Barbados. All of the passengers and most of the crew are on deck for the captain's party. Hello, my name is Pierre Lafontaine. I'm from Montreal. Hi, I'm Heather Hillman. Where do you come from? I come from Montgomery. Montgomery, where's that? It's in Alabama. Haven't you heard of Alabama? Oh yes, of course, Alabama. It's in the south. I've never been to the south. What a terrible party. Oh really? Do you think so? Yes, I do. Oh, by the way, my name's Marianne Wilson. I'm Tom Gray. Nice to meet you. I work in a bank. What do you do? Well, I'm captain of this ship. It's my party. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. No problem. Would you like another drink? What? Would you like another drink? Oh, yes, please. I'd like some orange juice. With ice? No, thanks. Using the telephone. Two, one, two, three, three, two, one, five, oh, six. That's it. Thank you for calling XYZ Records Incorporated. You are in a call waiting system. Please hold. Your call is very important to us. As soon as an operator is free, we'll talk with you. XYZ, can I help you? I'd like to speak to James Singh, please. Which department? Accounting. Please hold. I'm connecting you. Thank you for calling Lemon Computers. If you are calling from a touchtone phone and you know the extension number you require, you may dial it now or at any time during this message. For sales and marketing, press 1 now. For customer service, press 3 now. For all other inquiries, press 0. Or stay on the line and someone will assist you shortly. Thank you for calling Lemon Computers. Lemon Computers, may I help you? Can I speak to Simon Herx, please? One moment. Let's see, I press zero first, then the area code and number. What's the area code for Honolulu? Right, 808. Oh, 808. 7259316. Operator. Hello, this is a collect call. What name? Sanuski. Paula Sanuski. Can you spell that, please? That's S I N. E-W-S-K-I. Just a moment. Please hold. Thank you. When you call directory assistance, you hear a recorded message. Listen to these five conversations. One. Directory assistance, what city? In Minneapolis, please. What name? Nelson, Mr. P. 1999 Stinson Boulevard in Columbia Heights. Thank you for calling Minnesota Telephone. The number is 3349045. 2. Directory assistance, what city? San Francisco. What name? Slick, Ms. G, at 2400 Fulton Street, San Francisco. Thank you for calling Pacific Bell. The number is 6850124. Three. Directory assistance, what city? Miami. What name? Buffett, J, on Alton Road in Miami Beach. I don't know the address. Thank you for calling Southeast Bell. The number is 766-5501. Four. Directory assistance, what city? Boston, please. What name? Knight. J. It's somewhere in the Jamaica Plain area. 
There's a J Knight on Arbor Way. That's the one. Thank you for calling New England Telephone. The number is five five two seven one three six. Five. Directory assistance. What city? Chicago. What name? Butterfield. P. On Fifty Ninth Street, by the Midway Airport. Thank you for calling Illinois Bell. The number is four o one o o three three. Fizz is fantastic. Meet Mr. and Mrs. Lopez of San Antonio, Texas. They have three young children, and they have to do a lot of wash. There are two piles of dirty clothes on this table. With this pile, we're going to use new fizz, and with that pile, we're going to use another leading detergent. We have two identical washing machines here. The only difference is fizz. While the machines are working, let's have some coffee. Okay, both machines have stopped, and Mr. Lopez has taken the clothes out. Well, Mr. Lopez, what do you think? Well, we washed these clothes in fizz, and those clothes in the other detergent. Can you see any difference? I sure can. These clothes over here are much cleaner, and they're whiter and softer than those over there. These clothes? We washed these clothes with new fizz. That's right, Brian. It's really much better than our usual detergent. Our clothes have never been cleaner than this. So which detergent are you going to use from now on? New Fizz, of course. It's the best detergent we've ever used. Olympic update. It's time now for our Olympic update, coming to you live by satellite from the Olympic Games. Here's our reporter, Pat Sweeney. This is the Olympic swimming pool at the center of the Olympic complex. The most important event today was certainly the women's 200-meter freestyle competition. An American, Sierra Kennedy, was first and won the gold medal. She swam the 200 meters in a new world record of 1 minute 56 seconds. The United States won two gold medals yesterday and three the day before. So in the first three days of the Olympic Games, the American team has won six gold medals. Here you see Jack Lumber from Canada. This morning, he won the men's javelin final. On his first try, he threw the javelin over 100 meters. Nobody has ever done that before. A new world record. Unfortunately, there was nearly a terrible accident in the javelin event. Harvey Jones, the American competitor, slipped when he was throwing his javelin, and it hit a judge in the foot. Luckily, the judge was fine. Here we are in the Olympic Gymnasium. Olga Ivanov, the 15-year-old Russian gymnast, has just finished her routine. We're waiting for the results now. And here they are. She has an average of 9.5 points. That's the best score today. Olga's won the gold medal. We're waiting for the last jumper. Ted Kelly from Great Britain is going to jump. The bar is at 2.30 meters. Now he's beginning his last try. And he's jumped! Oh! He's crashed into the bar. He's landing. The bar's fallen. Is he hurt? No. No, he's all right. He's getting up and walking away. But he's a very disappointed man. Waiting for a friend. What's the matter, Debbie? I'm waiting for a letter from Nick. It wasn't here yesterday, and it isn't here today either. Don't worry, honey. It'll be here tomorrow. Will it? I don't know. The next day. Mom, it's here. And Nick's coming to Pittsburgh. Oh, really? When? He'll be here next Monday. What time will he be here? You have classes on Monday. He'll be on the 740 train. 
Oh, Mom, can he stay with us? Well, I don't know. Oh, okay, sure. I've heard so much about him, I'd like to meet him. The next Monday. Debbie, the train won't be here for ten minutes. Let's get a soda or something. No, thanks, Mom. You guys get a soda. All right. Where will you be? I'll be right here. Ten minutes later. Well, the train's late. It'll be here soon. Uh, Mom, can you and Sarah wait in the coffee shop? Why, dear? I want to say hello to Nick on my own. Is that okay? Sure. But we've just had a soda. We'll be in the bookstore right over there. Thanks, Mom. I won't be long. Listen to the station announcements. The trains will be late. When will they be here? One. The train from Philadelphia will be five minutes late. The new time of arrival will be 6.50 p.m. on track three. Two. The 7.15 p.m. train from Cincinnati, continuing on to Philadelphia, will now be here at 7.30 p.m., arriving on track five. The 7.15 p.m. train from Cincinnati, continuing on to Philadelphia, will now be here at 7.30 p.m. on track five. Three. There will be a one-hour delay on the 7.40 from Chicago and Cleveland. The train will now be here at 8.39 p.m. on track four. We apologize for any inconvenience. Four. The 8.20 arrival from St. Louis will be on track one. This train will be just two minutes late. The St. Louis train will be just two minutes late at 8.22 p.m. Monday morning. What's the matter, honey? Oh, I don't know. Come on, something's the matter. What is it? It's just life. It's so boring. It's not that bad. We have two wonderful children. That's right, we do. And we never have any time with them. Well, we both have to work, hon. We need the money. Okay, but it's all right for you. I'll leave in five minutes, but you'll be here all day. I won't be home till six. Sure, but your day will be interesting, and you'll meet people. I'll be here in front of the computer screen all day. I won't talk to anyone. You're a computer programmer, Dan. That's your job. You're lucky. You can work at home. Yeah, but you like your job, Rosie. You really do. What? Who will I meet today? Tell me that. What will I do? I'll tell you, Dan. I'll get on the same train, then I'll go to the same office. I'll speak to the same boring people, and I'll listen to the same stupid jokes. I'll get the same train home, then I'll get home and help the kids with their homework. I'll cook dinner, honey. I always do. Yeah, but I'll wash the dishes. Then we'll watch TV again. You'll be tired, and we won't talk. Then we'll do the same tomorrow. What a life! Today, tomorrow, this week, next week, this month, next month, next year, forever! It's just Monday morning, Rosie. You'll feel okay tomorrow. Will I? Good luck, Waldo. Good evening, and welcome to Channel 35 News. The 66-year-old Monterey man, Mr. Walter Busby, is in the studio with us. Mr. Busby is a retired bank clerk. Tomorrow morning, he will begin a fantastic voyage. He and his wife, Betty, are going to sail from Monterey, California, to Australia. That's 7,000 miles across the ocean in a small motorboat. Now, Walter. Please call me Waldo. All my friends call me Waldo. All right, Waldo. Why are you doing this? Well, I haven't seen my son for ten years. He lives in Australia, and we've never seen our grandchildren. But your boat isn't very big, Waldo. Will it get to Australia? Oh, yes. I think so. 
it'll get there all right. It'll take a long time, of course, but we're not in a hurry. I just retired, you see, and we'll stop on the way. Where will you stop? Do you know? Oh, yes. We have a map. Here it is. We'll stop at several places. We'll need food and gas. Ah, yes, food. What'll you do about food? No problem. We'll catch fish. I see. And water? That won't be a problem either. It'll rain. It rains a lot at sea, you know. Will you take a radio with you? No, no, no. We never listen to the radio. We don't like pop music. We like some peace and quiet. We'll take a lot of books. Well, actually, I meant a two-way radio. How will you navigate? Will you use a compass? A compass? No. We won't need a compass or a radio. We'll navigate by the sun and stars. I got a book from the library. Well, good luck, Waldo. You'll certainly need it. Listen to the news report. This is Channel 35 News. Walter and Betty Busby are recovering tonight in Monterey Hospital. They left Monterey Bay this morning at 6.30 in their boat, Titanic 2. They were sailing to Australia. Seven miles out of Monterey, their engines stopped, and the boat turned over in heavy seas. They held on to the boat, and a helicopter rescued them. This was not Mr. and Mrs. Busby's first accident on the ocean. They have been rescued three times before. They were cold and wet, but cheerful. Mr. Busby said, we're looking for a bigger boat. We'll get to Australia one day. We had some bad luck. It happened to me. A short flight. Last year, I had to fly to London for business. I can't sleep on airplanes, so my doctor gave me some sleeping pills. I got onto the plane, sat down, and took two pills. We took off, and a few minutes later, I was asleep. When I woke, the flight attendant was shaking my arm. I was the only passenger on the plane. Those pills were strong, I thought. I went to the baggage claim area. I couldn't see my bags anywhere. I went to the information desk and asked about my bags. Which flight were you on? asked the desk clerk. The flight from New York, 743, I said. But you didn't go anywhere, ma'am. Your aircraft had a problem with the engines and it came back. This is New York. Wilhelmina C. Williams, Patterson, New Jersey. Sleepwalker. My kid sister often walked in her sleep. One night I woke up suddenly. My sister was walking out of our room with her eyes closed. I got up and followed her to the kitchen. She opened the fridge and took out some chocolate cheesecake. Her eyes never opened. She ate it, then went back to our room. I told her in the morning, but she didn't believe me. Look in the mirror, I said. There was chocolate all around her mouth and nose. Candy Faulkner, Oxford, Mississippi. What a nightmare. I once had a terrible nightmare. I dreamed I was in a hotel room on the 40th floor. The hotel was on fire. Smoke was coming under the door. I couldn't open the window. I hit it with a chair, but I couldn't break it. The room got hotter and hotter and the smoke got thicker and thicker. This is the end, I thought. Then I heard a crash. Right then, I woke up. I was at home in my own bed, in my own room, and the room really was full of smoke. The window was open, and a firefighter was climbing into the room. He rescued me. My apartment was on fire. Jackson Burns, Seattle, Washington. at a drugstore. Can I help you? Yes, thank you. I have a terrible headache. How long have you had it? About two or three hours. Well, try these pills. Take two every four hours. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Could I have a box of throat lozenges, please? With antiseptic or without? With. There you go. Will that be all? 
Yes, that's all. Sorry, I only have a fifty-dollar bill. Okay, out of fifty. Here's your change. Thank you. You're welcome. Could you fill this prescription, please? Sure. Do you want to wait? How long will it take? It'll be ready in about twenty minutes. Oh, I'll come back later. All right. It'll be waiting. Should I pay now or later? Later will be fine. Superstar. Come in. Yes, Miss Baloney. No, no, Gary. I don't want you. Who do you want, Miss Baloney? I want Marvin, and I want him right away. Okay, I'll go and find him. Uh, Marvin, did you want to see me, ma'am? Yes, I wanted to see you twenty minutes ago. I'm sorry, I was in the garage. I want a car this afternoon. Which car do you want to take? The stretch limo, the Rolls Royce, or the Ferrari? The stretch limo. Where do you want to go, ma'am? The recording studio. What time? The recording session begins at two. We'll leave here at one thirty. Okay, Brandon. Can you hear me? Sure. I want you to play electric piano on this one. No problem. And I want Jared to play acoustic guitar. I want him to play real loudly. Okay? You got it. And find Tanya and Sophie. I want them to sing doo wops. Excuse me? You know the chorus, doo wop dee diddy diddy dum dee doo. Look, feel, taste, sound, smell. I like your car, Jackie. Oh, you do? I've only had it for a week. It looks very expensive. Really? I guess new ones are expensive, but this one's used. It is? It doesn't look like a used car. It looks brand new. <sighs> it feels cold in here. It does? Yes, really cold. Is the heat on? Yes, it is. It'll feel warmer in a minute. Waiter. Yes, sir. These vegetables aren't fresh. But they are fresh, sir. Well, they don't taste fresh to me. I want you to get the manager. I'd like you to listen to my new stereo, Eduardo. Does it sound all right? Yes, it sounds fine to me. I think the bass is too loud. No, it sounds perfect. It sounds better than mine. Have you changed your perfume? Yes. Why do you like it? Yes, it smells wonderful. What is it? It's Rosanne by Devlon. It smells expensive, is it? I don't know. It was a present. A science fiction story. The spaceship flew around the new planet several times. The planet was blue and green. They couldn't see the surface of the planet because there were too many white clouds. Then the spaceship descended slowly through the clouds and landed in the middle of a green forest. The two astronauts put on their spacesuits, opened the door, climbed carefully down the ladder, and stepped onto the planet. The woman looked at a small control unit on her arm. "It's okay," she said to the man. "We can breathe the air. It's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen." Both of them took off their helmets and breathed deeply. They looked at everything carefully. All the plants and animals looked new and strange. They couldn't find any intelligent life. After several hours, they returned to their spaceship. Everything looked normal. The man turned on the controls, but nothing happened. Something's wrong, he said. I don't understand. The engines aren't working. He switched on the computer, but that didn't work either. Eve, he said, we're stuck here. We can't take off. Don't worry, Adam," she replied. "They'll rescue us soon."
It's too hot. In the hotel coffee shop. Come on, Kim. Hurry up and finish your coffee. We have to catch a taxi to the airport. We'll be late. I can't hurry. This coffee's too hot for me to drink. Why don't you put some cold milk in it? Milk? I don't take milk in my coffee. Oh, okay, okay. Is it cool enough for you to drink now? Yes, but it tastes awful. At the airport. Oh, no. The global counter looks a mile away. Ooh. What did you put in these suitcases? Rocks? Only clothes. Why? Are they heavy? Yes, they are. The taxi driver managed to carry them. Well, they're too heavy for me to carry, and I don't see any luggage carts. Well, I'm not strong enough to help you. Porter, over here, please. On the plane. Oh, Mike, I didn't tell you. My sister called this morning. Oh? Which one? Tiffany? Yes. She wants to get married. Married? She isn't old enough to get married. She's only 17. Who does she want to marry? Mark McIntosh. Mark McIntosh, the actor? I can't believe it. He's too old for her. He's over 60. I know, but she loves him. At their destination, Oh, no. There goes the last bus. Well, let's walk to the highway and catch a different bus. It's a mile away. That's too far for me to walk. Let's take a taxi. Another taxi. We aren't rich enough to go everywhere by taxi. Mike, haven't you forgotten something? What? We have three suitcases. Do you really want to walk? You're right. Taxi! Two phone calls. Hello? Vicky, is that you? Uh-huh. Who's this? It's Randy. Randy? Randy who? What do you mean, Randy who? Randy Dixon, of course. Oh, Randy. I'm sorry. Yes. We had a date last night. Where were you? I waited for two hours. I'm sorry, Randy. I couldn't come. Couldn't come? Why not? Well, I had to wash my hair. Wash your hair? Why didn't you call me? I wanted to call you, but, uh, I, uh, couldn't remember your phone number. It's in the phone book. Yes, of course, but, uh, I couldn't remember your last name. Oh. But why did you have to wash your hair last night? Well, I had to do it last night because I'm going to see a play tonight. To see a play? With who? George. George McQueen. My boss's son. I see. He asked me yesterday, and I couldn't say no. Listening. Listen to the next phone call. Who is the manager talking to? Now listen again and check true or false. Hello? Good morning. This is the First State Bank. My name is Bridget O'Connor. I'm the manager. Oh, yes? Did you get my letter? What letter was that? Well, I wanted to see you. I called yesterday, but I couldn't get an answer. Was that in the morning? That's right. I'm sorry. I wasn't here. I had to see my doctor. I've had problems with my leg. I wanted to ask you about your account. My account? Yes. You wrote a check for $1,000 last week. A thousand dollars? Yes, and there's only one fifty-two ninety-five in your account. But I don't have an account with First State. Now look here, Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump? Who's Mr. Trump? I'm not Mr. Trump. I'm sorry, is this 848-3592? Say that again. 848-3592. Ah, this is 848-3952. My name's Sikorsky. You have the wrong number. Oh. Army Recruiting Office. Good morning. 
Are you the new janitor of the building? Janitor? No, not me. I want to join the army, man. What? You in the army? Yeah, I want to be a soldier. This is the army recruiting office, isn't it? Well, uh, yes. Sit down, son. Thanks, man. Now, why do you want to be a soldier, Mr... Uh, what's your name, son? Corona. Frankie Corona. Well, I saw the commercial on TV last night. It looked pretty good. Vacations, money, travel, education, a pension. I see. Yes, it's a good life in the army. Terrific! Now, do you have any questions? Let's see. Yes, will I have to get a haircut? Oh, yes, you'll have to get a haircut and wear a uniform. A uniform? I've never had to wear a uniform before. Oh, yes, and you'll have to obey orders. But you won't have to clean latrines. <laughs> what are latrines? Toilets. I've never had to clean toilets. What about the work? Will I have to work hard? Oh, yes, you'll have to work hard, all right. Hmm. And what about education? Oh, yes, there are a lot of opportunities. Maybe you'll be a computer programmer or a communications expert one day. Okay, I'd like to join. All right, just sign here, Frankie. There you go, man, Frankie Corona. Corona. Huh? Stand up. Stand up straight, Corona. Now, march. Left, right, left, right. You're in the army now. A traffic survey. All major cities have traffic problems. Toronto has too many cars and not enough parking spaces in the city center. Traffic moves slowly downtown and parking costs are extremely high. The planning department wanted to change the traffic system, so they conducted a traffic survey. They interviewed a lot of people in downtown Toronto. One. David Chang is 58. He learned to drive when he was 18. He's been able to drive for 40 years. He lives about 20 miles away. He always comes downtown by car. 2. Leila Patel is 25. She's been able to drive for 6 years, but she doesn't have a car. She hasn't been able to save enough money. She lives about 35 miles away. She always comes into town by train. 3. Douglas McKenzie is 20. He's had a lot of driving lessons. He's taken the driving test three times, but he hasn't been able to pass the test yet. He lives near the city center and works in a mall downtown. He usually walks to work. 4. Mr. and Mrs. Hawkins are both over 65. They've never been able to drive. They've never learned. They don't live far from downtown, and they occasionally come downtown by streetcar. 5. Excuse me, ma'am? Yes? We're doing a traffic survey. Could I ask you a few questions? Okay. Your name is? Green. Michelle Green. And, uh, how old are you? 29. Can you drive? Sure. And how long have you been able to drive? Since I was 19. Uh-huh. Where do you live? Oxford Street. Ah, that's not far away. How do you usually get downtown? By bicycle. By bicycle? That's unusual. Thank you. Oh, is that all? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Six. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, what? May I ask you a few questions? A questions? About what? You're not from the police, are you? No, no. It's just a traffic survey, that's all. Well, all right then. What's your name? Uh, Jones. Wayne Jones, eh? How old are you, Mr. Jones? Uh, 22, eh? Can you drive? Yeah, but I don't drive much. How long have you been able to drive? Um, about four years. But I told you, I don't drive much. I come into town on my motorcycle. It's a Harley Davidson. It's over there, the red one. Um, where do you live, Mr. Jones? Uh, the university. I'm a student, eh? Oh, really? Yeah, I'm studying philosophy.
changes. Why do you want to study computer programming? Well, I lost my job last month, and I haven't been able to find another one. I see. Do you have any money? Well, some, and my girlfriend will be able to help me. Good. The course costs $2,500. Ooh, will I be able to find a job as a computer programmer? Oh, sure. You'll be able to get a good job and make lots of money. Please sign here. This is the room. Do you like it? It's very nice. Is it quiet? I'm a writer. You'll be able to work with no problem. There's almost no noise here. Will I be able to use the kitchen? Yes, of course. Fine. It looks good. What's that? Oh, that's just our neighbor. He works on old cars. He's usually quiet. Have a seat, Jim. You work in the mailroom, right? That's right. I want to transfer to the International Sales Division. Why do you want to join the International Division, Jim? Well, I don't, really. I just want to travel to Latin America. How good is your Spanish? Spanish? I've never been able to learn Spanish. Well, what will you be able to do in the International Sales Division? I don't know, but I won't be able to work very hard. I have a bad back. Checks and money. Next. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to cash this check, please. Okay. Two hundred dollars. Oh, you haven't signed it. Really? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. How would you like the money? Twenties, please. Oh, and could I have twenty dollars in smaller bills? Sure. Twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, one hundred, one twenty, one forty, one sixty, one eighty, one ninety, one ninety-five. Six, seven, eight, nine, two hundred. I'd like to get this, but I don't have enough cash on me. Do you take traveler's checks? Yes, of course. Good. Here you are. Thank you. I'll need some identification too. Sure. Is my driver's license all right? Yes, that's fine. Just sign and date it. I have a stamp with the store's name. Hello, can I help you? Thank you. My name is Toshiko Akiyama. I'm expecting a transfer from my bank in Tokyo. Let me see. Here it is, Akiyama, two thousand dollars from the Fuji Bank in Tokyo. Do you have your driver's license with you? No, but I have my passport. Will that be all right? Yes, of course. Excursion to Egypt. I'd like to make a reservation for the excursion to Egypt leaving July 16th. The one at the Cleopatra Hotel? That's it. How far is it from the hotel to the beach? About a two-minute walk. Good. How hot is it in Egypt in July? About 32 degrees centigrade. That's 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the Great Pyramid. Oh, yes. It looks very high. It's about 137 meters high. How long are the sides? They're 230 meters long. Wow! How old is it? It's almost four and a half thousand years old. We're going through the Suez Canal now. It doesn't look very wide. How wide is it? About 60 meters wide and 160 kilometers long. Really? This is a big ship. How deep is the canal? The average depth is about 10 meters. Hello, Mr. Harris. Are you coming on the bus trip to Cairo tomorrow? Yes. How far is it? It's about 150 kilometers. How long will it take to get there? About three hours. Everybody's in a hurry. Ten years ago, Ford Studebaker had an accident in his car. He was driving quickly and carelessly. After the accident, his wife said, Ford, you're an old man now. You have to drive more slowly and more carefully. 
Ford has not had an accident since then. He always drives slowly, very slowly. But the drivers behind him often get angry. They sometimes have to stop suddenly and then other cars crash into them. Ford always drives in the middle of the road and other drivers can't pass him. They sound their horns and flash their lights because they want Ford to go more quickly. But Ford never notices them and he never sees the accidents behind him. When he reads about the accidents in the newspaper, he says to his wife, People drive more carelessly these days. Everybody's in a hurry. I don't understand it. Natasha Terranova is a tennis star. She's one of the best players in the world. She hits the ball hard and fast, harder and faster than any other player. But many people dislike her because she often behaves badly. She sometimes gets very angry. Last year, she shouted at the crowd and broke her racket on the ground during the final of the Texas Championship. She didn't play well and lost. This year, she played better and won the final. Unfortunately, she got very angry and behaved worse than last year. She threw her racket at the umpire. She will never be able to play in the Texas Championship again. A Day Off Al Bellini works for an import-export company in Los Angeles. One morning last summer, Al called his office at 9 o'clock. His boss, Ralph Vasquez, answered the phone. Hello, Ralph Vasquez. Hello, Ralph. This is Al Bellini. Oh, hi, Al. What's up? I don't think I can come to work today, Ralph. Oh, what's the problem? I've got a very bad sore throat. Yes, you sound sick. Yes. I'll stay in bed today, but I'll be able to come tomorrow. That's all right, Al. Stay in bed until you feel well enough to come to work. Thank you, Ralph. Goodbye. Bye, Al. Ralph liked Al a lot. At 12.30, he got into his car, drove to a store, and bought some fruit for him. He went to Al's apartment and rang the doorbell. Al's wife, Stella, answered the door. Oh, Ralph, hello. Come in. How are you? Fine, thanks, Stella. I've come to see Al. How is he? He doesn't look very well. I wanted him to see the doctor. I'll go in and see him. Hi, Al. Oh, hi. Hi, Ralph. Uh, have a seat. I've brought some fruit for you, Al. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Well, I was in the neighborhood anyway. How's your throat? It seems a little better. I'll be okay tomorrow. Good, good. Take care. Goodbye, Al. Bye, Ralph. Thanks for coming by. At three o'clock, Ralph locked his office door and turned on his portable TV. He wanted to watch an important baseball game. It was the Atlanta Braves versus the Los Angeles Dodgers. Both teams were playing well, but neither team could score. The crowd was cheering and booing. It was very exciting. Then at 3.20, Sam Zapata of the Dodgers hit a home run. Ralph jumped out of his chair. He was very excited. He was smiling happily when suddenly the cameraman focused on the crowd. Ralph's smile disappeared, and he looked very upset. Al Bellini's face, in close-up, was there on the screen. He didn't look sick, and he didn't sound sick. He was smiling happily and cheering wildly. Applying for a job. How do you do? It's Paula Chandler, isn't it? Yes. How do you do? Have a seat. I'm Art Miranda, and I have your application form here. I just want to check the information. Fine. Sure. You're applying for the position of Export Sales Representative. 
aren't you? Yes, I am. You aren't from Connecticut, are you? No, I'm not. I'm from Massachusetts. You got a bachelor's degree in business administration at college, didn't you? Yes, that's right. But you didn't get a master's degree, did you? No, I didn't. And you have worked in international sales, haven't you? Yes, I have. I've been a sales representative in Mexico and Central America. But you haven't worked in Brazil, have you? No, I haven't. But I'd like to. You can speak Spanish, can't you? Yes, I can. But you can't speak Portuguese, can you? No, I can't. But I'd like to learn Portuguese. Come in. Have a seat. It's Paul Lanier, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Well, I've looked over your application. Can I just check the information? Yes, of course. You're applying for a secretarial job. Yes, a bilingual secretarial job. You aren't from Bridgeport. No, I'm from Fairfield. And you went to school in Fairfield. That's correct. Fairfield High. But you didn't go to college. No, I didn't. You can speak French well. Yes, my parents are French Canadian. But you can't speak German. No, no, I can't. But I can speak Spanish. You've been a secretary for two years. Yes. But you haven't stayed in one job for much time. No, I haven't. I've worked in some awful places. Disasters. Good evening. Our program tonight is about disasters. This year, there have been fires, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. All our guests tonight have survived disasters. Hello, I'm Susan Fisher Diaz. I live in Chicago. I was working in my office on the 28th floor of a skyscraper. I was dictating some letters to my secretary when the fire alarm rang. I rushed out to the elevator, but it wasn't working. The stairs were full of thick smoke. We couldn't go down, so we had to go up to the roof. When we got there, some people were waiting calmly. Others were shouting and screaming wildly. A helicopter managed to land on the roof and rescued six of us before the roof collapsed. My name's Linda Reed. I was on vacation at the Med Club on Patapita, a small island in the South Pacific. I was taking a nap when the volcano erupted. The noise woke me up. I looked out of the window. Everybody was running toward the harbor. I threw on my robe and ran to the harbor too. I managed to get on a cruise ship. It was leaving when the lava hit town. Hi, my name's Richard Ching. My wife and I were staying with friends in Santa Labrada near Los Angeles. We were having dinner when the earthquake began. Everything shook. All the plates and food fell on the floor. We were picking everything up when the ceiling fell in. Fortunately, we were under the table and survived. We had to wait for hours before help arrived. Traveling by air. One. Global Airways announces the departure of the 11 o'clock flight GL-189 to Houston. This flight is now boarding at gate 4. 2. British Airways announces the departure of the 11.30 Concorde service BA-001 to London. Would passengers for this flight go immediately to gate 16? 3. Would passengers for the 1125 Aeromexico flight 149 to Mexico City please go immediately to gate 13, where this flight is now boarding? 4. This is the last call for Japan Airlines 1045, flight 215 to Tokyo. This flight is now closing at gate 30. Do I check in here for global flight 179 to Caracas? Do you already have your ticket? Yes, I do. Thank you. May I see your passport? There you go. Can you put your luggage up here, please? Sure. Just one case? Yes, that's all. Did you pack the case yourself? Yes, I did. And you haven't left it anywhere, have you? No, it's been with me all the time. Are there any electrical items in the case? 
No, there aren't. Okay, that's fine. Do you have a seating preference? Yes, I do. I'd like a window seat, please. Fine. Seat 12A. Here's your ticket and your boarding pass. Thank you. The flight leaves from gate 4 in the south terminal. Please report to the gate by 10.30. Enjoy your flight. Excuse me, ma'am. May I see the contents of your pockets? Of course. Thank you. Put everything in this container. Now, please go back and come through the detector again. Sure. Oh, wait. It's my metal comb. Here it is. That's fine. Put it with your other things. Now, come through again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain speaking. I'd like to welcome you all aboard Global's Flight 179 to Caracas. We're now flying at an altitude of 33,000 feet, and our speed is approximately 500 miles per hour. We'll land in Caracas in three and a half hours at 1.20 local time. The temperature in Caracas is a sunny 87 degrees Fahrenheit, about 31 degrees Celsius. In a few minutes, you'll be able to see the Gulf of Mexico on our left. Our flight attendants will serve lunch in a few minutes. Enjoy your flight, and thank you for choosing Global. I've cut myself. Ow! This knife's sharp. I've cut myself. Let me see. Oh, you haven't cut yourself badly. It's just a scratch. But it's bleeding. It's not bleeding much. I'll get a Band-Aid. Did you see the play on Channel 13 last night? No, I didn't. What was it? Romeo and Juliet. I cried. You cried? Why? Well, it was very sad. At the end, Romeo killed himself, and then Juliet killed herself. It sounds dumb to me. Why did they kill themselves? For love. Oh, they were dumb, weren't they? My guests tonight are the rock stars M.C. Malone and T.N.T. Katz. Hi, Sid. We're happy to be here. You both play the guitar and sing very well. How did you learn? Well, we just bought some guitars and we taught ourselves. You taught yourselves. Terrific. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, that's all right, Yolanda. Yesterday was my first wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thanks. We went to that new restaurant on Bank Street. Did you enjoy yourselves? Oh, yes. We had a very good time. Have you seen my new microwave oven? No, I haven't. Oh, it's fabulous. It has an automatic timer. It can turn itself on and off. And it cleans itself. Choosing a pet. Hello. How are you today? Can I help you? Yes. I'm looking for a pet for my son. Can you suggest anything? What kind of pet does he want? A traditional pet? A cat or a dog? Or something unusual? Well, he'd like a snake or an alligator, but he isn't going to get one. We have a nice dog right now, a Rottweiler. A Rottweiler? Oh no, I've heard about them on the news. They're very big and mean. Oh no, ma'am, they aren't as mean as some dogs. Really? Yes, really. Last week we had a small dog here. It was only as big as your purse, but it was as mean as the devil. It bit me three times. Let's forget dogs then. What about a cat? A cat. Hmm, they aren't as friendly as dogs, are they? No, but they don't eat as much as dogs either, and they're very clean. Hmm. Or what about a bird, a parrot or a parakeet? We have both. Which do you recommend? Well, parakeets aren't as easy to train, and they never speak as well as parrots. Yes, but parakeets don't need as much space as parrots, do they? <laughs> That's true. Parakeets are very popular because they're so easy to keep. Yes, but they're a little noisy, aren't they? I want a quiet pet. A quiet pet? Well... What about a goldfish? There's nothing as quiet as a goldfish. 
An interrogation. You're John Patrick O'Brien. Yes, I am. You sell used cars. Yes, I do. And other things. You live on Staten Island. Yes, I do. I live in Richmond Town. You went to the races at Montville yesterday. That's right. You weren't alone. No, I wasn't. I was with my friend, Bobby Ann Chase. But you're married. O'Brien. No. Who told you that? You left your apartment at 11 o'clock. Yes, about 11. You were in your Cadillac. Yes, I was. You didn't stop for gas. No. You had lunch at a Chinese restaurant. No, we didn't. We had lunch at a fast food place. You don't remember the name of the place. No, I'm afraid I don't. You had fried chicken. No, no, we got some hamburgers to go and ate in the car. You got to Montville Racetrack in time for the first race. Yes, correct. You were very lucky. Yes, I really was. You won $50,000. I can't remember exactly how much. There was $50,000 in your apartment. Was there? You don't know where Bobby Ann is now. No, I'm not her husband. But you left her in Midtown Manhattan because she wanted to buy some clothes. Yes, that's right. It's interesting. Oh, Brian. You have a very fast car. What do you mean? The last race at Montville started late, and it didn't finish until 25 after 5. So you drove from Montville on Long Island to Midtown Manhattan to Staten Island in 35 minutes at rush hour. That's impossible. Oh, Brian. Going to a party. Hi, great to see you. Come in. Hi, Jake. Uh, I'm not the first, am I? No, the others are all in the dining room. The food's in there. Let me take your coat. Thanks. Oh, I brought some flowers. Thank you. I'll put them in some water right away. Is Bruce coming? He's already here. Go on in. Hi, Kate. I like your dress. Thanks. Have you seen Bruce? Bruce? Oh, yeah, Bruce. He was here a second ago. Have you had something to eat? No, not yet. The vegetables and dip are over there. Help yourself. Thank you. There's some salad over here. And there are some potato chips and nuts on the table. Okay. See you later. Hello, Kate. Not dancing? No, I'm just hanging out. You didn't see Bruce in the kitchen, did you? No. Oh. Hey, this is a great song, isn't it? Do you want to dance? Sure, why not? Well, here's your coat. Thanks for coming. It was nice of you to invite me. I really enjoyed myself. Good. You've got to come to Jake's birthday party next month. Okay. What happened to Bruce, do you know? He left early, I think. I didn't see Michelle either. No, I think she left early too. Oh well. Thanks again. Bye. Together again. Kelly Strong and Rod DeBiro are in the studio. They're acting in a scene from Together Again. In the movie, Kelly is Constance, a young nurse in Africa. Rod is Armand, a famous zoologist. Okay, scene 34, take 8. Let's try it again. Action. I love you, Armand. I love you too, Constance. But I have to go. I know. <laughs> but perhaps we'll never see each other again.
We will, Constance, because we love each other. Cut, cut, cut. That's not good enough. Take five, everybody. Okay, Kelly, come over here. Now, I know you don't like Rod, and I know he doesn't like you. Like? We hate each other, you know that. But you're actors, and in the movie, Constance and Armand love each other, right? Right, but... No buts! You have to look at each other. You have to touch each other, smile at each other, hold each other, and kiss each other, right? Right, but it's not all my fault. You know Rod, he's selfish. He only thinks about himself. He talks about himself all the time, and he only wants to see himself on film. I've heard this before, Kelly. Rod said exactly the same about you. So am I. I'm taking my vacation next month. Really? So am I. I need a change. So do I. I'm tired of the same office and the same people every day. Right. Where are you going? Florida. Oh, really? I went there last year. So did I. We always stay on the Florida Gulf Coast. We never go to Miami or Palm Beach. No, neither do I. It's too crowded there. Where exactly are you going? Sanibel Island. It's about 50 miles south of Sarasota. Do you know it? You're kidding. No, I'm not. I've been there three times. Well, so have we. And we're going there this year, too. Not to the Sand Dollar Resort. Yes, why? Well, I'll see you there. That's my hotel, too. A family problem. Vassar College, Poughkeepsie, New York, 12601, May 5th. Dear Daddy, thank you very much for the birthday present. I was very pleased with the Porsche, but I didn't like the color, so I'm going to take it back and change it. I saw Mark again yesterday. You're worried about him, aren't you? Well, don't worry about him. He's all right. He's very good at his job. He's a drummer in a rock band. I'm going to come to Washington next weekend. I'll bring Mark so you can meet him. Love, Caroline. P.S. We love each other very much. He isn't interested in your money. May 15th. Dear Caroline, I'm sorry about last weekend. I was very upset with Mr. Rodberg. I can't call him Mark, but he was very rude to me. I'm not a stupid old fool. I'm tired of dumb young men. I couldn't talk with him about anything. You love him, I know. I just feel sorry for you. And I'm worried about your future. Your friend likes rock music. He isn't interested in anything else. He isn't interested in you at all. You're making a terrible mistake. And I'm glad he isn't interested in my money because he isn't going to get any of it. Love, Daddy. Signed for Senator Calhoun in his absence by Joseph D. Pollard. Secretary to the Senator. The Yes, No Contest. Hi there, I'm Barry Smiles. Welcome to the Yes, No Contest. Our rules are very simple. I'll ask you questions for 30 seconds. You must answer, but you can't answer with yes or no. You can't nod or shake your head either. Now, here is our first contestant, Ann Mock from Palm Beach, Florida. What's your name? Anne. Anne Mock. Where are you from, Anne? Palm Beach. Did you say Palm Springs? No, Palm... Oh, I'm sorry, Anne. You said no. Our next contestant is Chuck Fleener from St. Louis, Missouri. It's Dr. Fleener, isn't it? That's right, but call me Chuck. Fine. You aren't nervous, are you, Chuck? I'm not nervous. 
Did you shake your head? I didn't. Are you sure? Yes, I'm... Oh, I'm sorry, Chuck. Better luck next time. Now, here's our third contestant. He's Richard or Apollo from Washington, D.C. Hello, Richard. Hello, Barry. You work in a bank, don't you? That's correct. Do you like your job? I enjoy it very much. Oh, do you? I said I enjoy it very much. Now, you aren't married, are you? I am married. Is your wife here tonight? She's at home in Washington. So she isn't here? Of course not. Do you have any children? I have two children. Two boys? A boy and a girl. And that's 30 seconds. You've done it, Richard. Isn't that wonderful, everybody? He's won tonight's jackpot prize, a brand new fully automatic dishwasher. I used to. Hello, Tom. This is your dad. Your old dad in the nursing home? Why aren't you here? Oh, hi, Dad. Um, I'm very busy. I can't visit you today. Uh, I'm sorry, Dad. Tom, Tom. You used to visit me. You used to take me to the movies. You used to bring Barbara and the children. I'm sorry, Dad. We'll come for your birthday. My birthday? It's today. You didn't even send a card. I'm writing a new will. Reggie, you used to be the best baseball player in the National League. Are you going to come back and play again? No, I'm not. No way. Why not? Well, baseball used to be the most important thing in my life, but it isn't anymore. I used to practice every day. I never used to go out or eat big meals or stay up late. Why has your life changed, Reggie? Well, I was poor then, but I'm not now. I don't need to play baseball anymore. Mom? What? There's a terrific movie downtown. Really? What is it? Space Cop. Are you going to see it? I'd like to. All the other guys are going, but I don't have any money. Okay, okay. How much do you want? Ten dollars. Ten dollars? When I was your age, I used to get two dollars for the movies. I know, I know. And you used to walk five miles to school, and you used to cut wood. And I used to talk to my mother with respect. A busy office. Yes, Erica, what is it? Bob Hudson wants to speak with you, JP. I'm very busy right now. Ask him to call back later. All right. Oh, and Erica. Tell Chris to fax the sales report to the Toronto office. Okay, anything else? Yes. Tell Helen not to call her friends on the office phone. All right, I will. Hello? This is Mr. Powell's assistant again. I'm afraid Mr. Powell's very busy right now. Could you call back later? All right, thanks. Oh, Chris? Yes, Erica? JP wants you to fax this report to Toronto. Okay, I'll do it later. No, Chris, do it now. I know it's important. Helen, did you call your friend on the office phone yesterday? Well, uh, yes, I did. But it was urgent. I think JP heard you. He wasn't very pleased about it. Don't use the office phone for personal calls, okay? Yes. Okay, Erica, I won't do it again. I'm sorry. Erica, did you speak with Bob Hudson? Yes, I did. I asked him to call back. He says he'll call you later. Fine. Has Chris faxed that report yet? Not yet, but I told him to do it immediately. I think he's doing it now. Good. Did you tell Helen not to call her friend from here? Yes. I told her not to use the office phone for personal calls. She says she won't do it again. I'm sure she won't. Well, I hope you're right. Her friend is working in Saudi Arabia. The Smuggler Latka was a customs officer in Europe. He used to work in a small border town. It wasn't a busy town, and there wasn't much work. The road was usually very quiet, and there weren't many travelers. It wasn't a very interesting job, 
but Latka liked an easy life. About once a week, he used to meet an old man. His name was Spevna. He always used to arrive at the border early in the morning in a big truck. The truck was always empty. After a while, Latka became suspicious. He often used to search the truck, but he never found anything. One day, he asked Spevna about his job. Spevna laughed and said, I'm a smuggler. Last year, Latka moved to the United States. One night, he was having dinner in a restaurant in Los Angeles. On the other side of the restaurant, he saw Spevna drinking champagne. Latka walked over to him. Hello there. Hi. Do you remember me? Sure, of course I do. You're a customs officer. I used to be, but I'm not anymore. I retired last year, and I live with my daughter in Los Angeles now. I often used to search your truck in the old country. But you never found anything. No, I didn't. Can I ask you something? Of course you can. Were you a smuggler? Of course I was. But the truck was always empty. What were you smuggling? Trucks. Opinions. Good afternoon. Mrs. Archer? Yes. I'm from Channel 5 TV. We're doing a survey. Oh, really? Could I ask you a few questions? Well, uh... First, did you watch TV last night? Yes, after dinner, from about 7 o'clock. And did you watch any of our programs? Yes, most of the evening, till 11. So you saw Animals in Focus. What did you think of it? It was very interesting. I like wildlife programs. So you're interested in wildlife? Uh-huh. That kind of program always interests me. It's very difficult to film animals, you know. What about your husband? Did he watch it? Only for about five minutes. He's not interested in animals. Look, I'm very sorry, but I have to pick up the kids from school. Are there many more questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll give you the questionnaire. Could you and your husband complete it and mail it to us? Sure. First of all, Animals in Focus. What did you think of that? Great. Really great. It was educational, just right for the children. And chimpanzees always amuse me. Much more amusing than Lenny Hill in the next program. Some of his jokes are quite shocking. And young children are watching television at that time of night. Uh-huh. What about Texas, Texas? The worst kind of TV. This kind of program annoys me. It's all just money and sex. Not interesting. Okay. And the report on violence in the cities. What did you think of that? A very important program. The problem of violence worries everyone. The news? The news always interests me. There isn't enough news on TV. And lastly, the horror movie. Well, horror movies like this don't frighten me at all. I just turn them off. Advice. Hi, Keith. How's it going? Oh, hi. You don't look very happy. What's up? Oh, nothing really. I bought these jeans about two weeks ago, and they're too tight. I have to lose weight. Maybe you should go on a diet. Sure, but what kind of a diet? You should eat lots of salad and fruit. I hate salad. I prefer meat and french fries. And I love candy. There you go. You shouldn't eat too much meat, and you shouldn't eat candy at all. I know, Nick. Believe me, I know. What's the matter, Dario? You're very quiet today. I'm worried about my English. What's the problem? I'm not practicing enough. Why not? Well, it's hard to meet Americans. You should go out more. Where should I go? Maybe you should join a gym or take a class. Americans never speak to me. Well, you should speak first. What can I talk about? Sports. They're always interested in sports. Hello, Brian. You look tired today. Yes, I'm working too hard. You should take a few days off. I know I should, but we're just too busy. I'm working 12 hours a day. 12 hours a day? You're going to kill yourself. What else can I do? Maybe you should quit. I can't. I need the money. Congratulations. I'm David Burns, and I'm going to announce the winners. 
Senator Cheryl Adams is going to present the awards. And our first winner is 78-year-old Mrs. Flora Dobson. You all remember her. She's a very brave woman. She's the one that knocked out a robber with her walking stick. Step over here, Mrs. Dobson. Congratulations, Mrs. Dobson. Is that the stick that knocked him out? Pardon me? Oh, yes. This is the one, all right. This is the one that knocked him out. I hit him like this. Oh, dear. You won't hit me, will you? Well, thank you, Mrs. Dobson. Pardon me? Thank you. Thank you. And our second winner is Mr. Mac Foden. He's the one that drove his truck into Silver Creek and saved a town. Congratulations, Mr. Foden. You were very brave. How's your leg? Not too bad now. Thank you, Senator. And now we have a pair of twins, Mandy and Marie Fox from Wisconsin. You all remember them. They're the ones that pulled a nine-year-old boy from a frozen lake last January. Well done. Which one of you is Mandy and which one's Marie? I'm Mandy. And I'm Marie. Next, we have Travis Bar. Waiting. Hi, Amber. Is the boss in? Yes, Steve. Ms. Arnold's in her office and she's waiting for you. Oh, has she been waiting long? Yes, she has. She got in at 20 to 10. 20 to 10? So she's been waiting for 20 minutes? Wow, I'm in trouble. Well, she isn't very happy. Well, Vera Parker, hello. Are you waiting to see Dr. Lightfoot? Hi, Alice. Yes, I am. How long have you been waiting? Well, let's see. I've been waiting since 9 o'clock. So you haven't been waiting long. It's only 10 after 9. Right, I haven't. I've been reading this magazine. There's an interesting article here about operations. You shouldn't read that, Vera. You'll be worried. No, I won't. I enjoy medical articles, you know. I've been reading about heart surgery. There are some great pictures. Look! Alice? Alice, are you okay? Dan, call the waiter again. I've been trying to call him, Sally. But, Dan, we've been sitting here for 20 minutes, and I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm sorry, Sally. But he's talking to that woman. Yes, I see. He's been talking to her since we came in. Excuse me, waiter. Yes, ma'am. Do you want your check? The check? We haven't seen the menu yet. Well, I guess it's difficult to choose just five things out of a whole lifetime. I need a little time to think. Well... The most important thing for me was the birth of my son. But I guess everyone chooses a birth. But that really changes your life. That's the biggest change for sure. What else? Strange. I think the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. That's a long time ago. Really a long time. But I was in high school. And for me, it's like the line between being a kid and, I don't know, growing up. I don't think it changed my life. But I remember it so well. And everything was different after that. So that's two milestones then. Oh yes, and the day that I moved into this house. I've lived here for 20 years. I've always loved this house. Then there was my accident. I don't like talking about it, really. I fell down a mountain when I was skiing. I was in the hospital for six weeks. I couldn't walk for nearly a year. What else? That's not all. One more. Let me think. Uh, this sounds silly. A few years ago, I was in an elevator, and it stopped, just like that, between floors. I was alone there for five hours. I was terrified. I thought about my life and my family. I still have nightmares about it. A court case. A few months ago, there was a bank robbery in San Francisco. The police arrested a man and a woman. They're in court now. Mrs. Cato saw the robbery. She's on the witness stand. The judge and the 12 members of the jury are listening to her. A lawyer is asking her some questions. 
Now, Mrs. Cato, you saw the bank robbery, didn't you? Yes, I did. You saw a man, didn't you? That's right. I saw him when he went into the bank and when he came out. Now, look around the court. Do you see that man? Yes. He's the one. He's the man I saw. He wasn't alone when he went into the bank, was he? No, he wasn't. He was with a woman. Now, do you see that woman in the court? Yes. There. She's the woman I saw. I see, Mrs. Cato. Now, look at the man and woman again. This is very important. Are you absolutely sure about them? Absolutely sure. They're the people I saw. Now, Mrs. Cato, what was the man wearing when he went into the bank? I don't remember everything, but I remember his hat and his bag. Look at Exhibit A on the table. Is that the hat? Yes, that's the hat he was wearing. And Exhibit B? Yes, that's the bag he was carrying. Do you remember anything about the woman? Yes, she was wearing a black wig and red high-heeled shoes. How do you know she was wearing a wig, Mrs. Cato? Because it fell off when she was running to the car. Look at Exhibit C on the table. Is that the wig? Yes, that's the wig she was wearing. And Exhibit D, look at the shoes. Yes, they're the shoes she was wearing. Thank you, Mrs. Cato. The Empty Chair Jerry Streisen, a friend of mine in Boston, almost had a nervous breakdown last year. I told him to go to a doctor. Hello, Mr. Streisen. What's the problem? I'm very tense and nervous, doctor. I haven't been able to sleep for days. Hmm. Have you been working hard? Yes, I've been working 12 hours a day. Well, you should take a few days off. Go someplace quiet and peaceful, like Nantucket. It's a quiet island near the coast of... Jerry took a boat from New Bedford to Nantucket and arrived late Friday evening. He rang the doorbell of a boarding house, and the owner, Mrs. Searcy, answered the door. Then she showed him to his room. Jerry was very tired and went straight to bed. He slept well and didn't wake up until nine o'clock the next morning. Jerry went downstairs for breakfast. Because there weren't any other guests, Mrs. Searcy invited him to have breakfast with her and her daughter Catherine. Catherine was already sitting in the dining room. She was about 13 years old, with long black hair and clear gray eyes. Mrs. Searcy went to the kitchen to make breakfast. Jerry and Catherine looked at each other nervously for a few seconds. There are four places at the table. Is there another guest? No, we never talk about the empty place. The empty place? What do you mean? Well, that used to be my father's place. Used to be? I don't understand. My father worked on a fishing boat. Three years ago, he went out on his boat, and he never came back. What happened to him? Nobody knows. They searched everywhere, but they never found anything. My mother always keeps that place for him, and she makes his breakfast every morning. That's a picture of him, over there on the wall. My mother's been waiting for him for three years. Jerry said nothing, but he looked worried. At that moment, Mrs. Searcy came into the room. She poured three cups of coffee and put one cup at the empty place. Jerry looked more worried, and he stared at the empty chair. Suddenly, he heard footsteps outside the door, and a tall man with a black beard walked into the room. It was the man in the picture. Jerry jumped up and ran out of the room. Who was that? What's the matter with him? I don't know. I don't understand. He's a guest from Boston. He arrived last night after you went to sleep. Catherine, do you know anything about this? No, Daddy, I don't. But he's here because he's very nervous. He says he's hiding here because a tall man with a black beard is trying to kill him. Catherine, have you been telling stories again? <laughs> stories? Daddy? Me? How long? How much? Please have a seat. Thank you. I'm Esther Rosales. I've had an account here for ten years. 
What can I do for you, Ms. Rosales? Well, I want to borrow some money. What for? I want to buy a car. I've been saving for one. How long have you been saving? I've been saving for two years. How much have you saved? I've saved about $5,000. What are you reading? The Godfather. I've never seen the movie, and Bruce told me to read it. It's a very long book. How long have you been reading it? For nearly a month, and I haven't finished it yet. How many pages have you read? About 400. I don't like long books. Neither do I. Yes, ma'am. What can I do for you? Hi. Fill it up, please. Regular unleaded or super? Regular unleaded. It's nearly empty. I've been driving all day. Oh, really? How far have you driven? About 400 miles. From Atlanta. That's a long way. Check the oil? Yes. Okay. And finally, news about Kimberly Lewis, the athlete from Pennsylvania. Kimberly is jogging across the United States from New York to Los Angeles. She has just arrived in Kansas City, Missouri. Kimberly left New York two months ago and has traveled nearly 1,300 miles. Kimberly has collected nearly $300,000 for physically challenged children. She has used 12 pairs of running shoes and more than 100 pairs of socks. Operation Diamond Andrea Garvey is the assistant director of the Department of Customs and Immigration. She is preparing her agents for a special operation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You are all at Friday's meeting. Are there any questions? No? Okay, take out the photographs from your folders. Look at photograph one. That's Barry Siegel. He's the man that usually flies the diamonds into the USA. And he's the one that will land at the Circle K Ranch tomorrow night. Be careful. He's very dangerous. He's the one that shot a federal agent last year. Now photograph two. That's Gulliver. He's the one we really want. He's the one the Mexican police arrested last year, but they had to release him because they couldn't find any diamonds with him. He controls 20% of the illegal diamond trade. He's the one we have to catch with the diamonds and the money. Look at photograph three. Look at the woman on the right. Her name's Betty Lou Harris. She's working for us. She'll be at Gulliver's house at the ranch. She's the one that gave us the information. Watch out for the two men on the left, Farrell and Casey. They're the ones we've been following. They always carry guns, and they're the ones that will shoot first. Ms. Harris is probably the one they'll shoot. Do you all have photograph four? Good. Look at the airplane. It's a Cessna 310. It's the airplane that brings in the diamonds. It's the kind of plane that can fly under radar, land anywhere, and take off quickly. You can forget the registration number. It's different every time. Okay, photograph five. That's the area they're going to land in. Look at the trees in the background. They're the trees we're going to hide in. There's a road behind the trees, and that's the road they'll have to use. It's the only one. Finally, photograph six, the Circle K Ranch. It's very nice, isn't it? Gulliver has three houses, and this is the one he paid almost $5 million for last year. Look at the car outside. That's the car that will meet the plane. It's the car he always uses. We want Gulliver, Siegel, the diamonds, and the money all together. Any questions? No? Okay, good luck. Making Reservations Hello, Lobster Palace Restaurant. I'd like to make a reservation for tonight. All right. What time? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. For how many? There are ten of us. Ten. We don't usually take large parties. I know, but we are regular customers. What's your name, please? Diana Ross. 
Miss Ross. Of course, that will be all right. Party of ten at eight. I'd like to get two seats for the concert on Thursday. Where would you like to sit? I'm not sure. Well, here's the seating plan of the concert hall. How much is it in the middle section? Forty-five dollars. Forty-five dollars. That's a little too expensive for us. How much is it in the back? Twenty-five dollars. That's fine. What time does the concert start? At eight o'clock. Do you have any seats left on the Bay Area tour tomorrow? Yes, we do. There are a few seats left. Is that the tour that includes the Sonoma Valley? That's right. How long does the whole tour take? About seven hours. Should I pay you now? If you don't mind. A new job. Jeff, have you seen this ad in the New York Sentinel? Yes, I saw it, but I'm not interested in finding a new job. I've been here since I left college. I like working here. Really? I've only been here for three years, and I'm already tired of doing the same thing every day. I'm afraid of getting really bored. Oh, come on! It's not that bad. You'll do the same thing there every day. Yes, but the salaries are good. I'm not interested in making more money. I have enough now. I can never have enough. Of course, you live at home with your parents. I like living with my parents. What's wrong with that? Nothing. But I like being independent. I like traveling, and I enjoy meeting new people. I'm going to apply for the job. Well, good luck. Talking about the weather. Good morning, Libby. Hi, Jake. It's a nice day, isn't it? Yeah. What are you doing today? I'm not sure. I might go to the beach later. Well, take an umbrella. I've just seen the weather report. It might rain this afternoon. Good afternoon, Mrs. Acuna. Hello, Jake. It isn't very nice today, is it? It was a nice morning. It might stop raining soon. I hope so. Are you playing tennis today? Maybe. It depends on the weather. Good evening, Mr. Pastorius. Good evening, Jake. I think we might have a storm tonight. Oh, really? Yes. The sky is very dark, and I've just heard thunder. Oh, great! I like thunderstorms. I don't. I'm afraid of the lightning. Weather report. Good morning. I'm Wayne Porter, and here is the latest weather report from Channel 15. First, the national picture. The Pacific Coast will have strong winds, which might bring rain from Northern California through coastal regions of the Pacific Northwest. In the Rockies, there will be heavy snow. It will be cold and dry in the Midwest, with cloudy skies in the afternoon. Over to the Northeast, where there will be clear skies this morning. There might be some rain in the afternoon, but it won't be heavy. You can expect temperatures in the high 30s to low 40s. Finally, here in the Southeast, it will be warm and sunny in the morning, with a 40% chance of rain in the early afternoon. There will be rain in the evening, and there might be thunderstorms at that time. Now we're going over to Joan Zane in our Tampa studio for your local weather news. Good morning. I'm Wayne Porter with your latest weather news from Channel 15. Let's look at the national situation first. The Pacific Coast will have clear and sunny skies all day, but it will be quite cold. The Rockies can expect further heavy snowfalls in the north, and it will be extremely cold. The Midwest will have strong winds coming down from Canada. And these winds will bring a lot of rain into the region. There might be snow in the west of the region later. The northeast will have cloudy skies with temperatures in the mid 40s. There will be strong winds and heavy rain on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and there might be thunderstorms later in the day. These storms might move across into Florida by the early evening. In Florida, it will be a very hot, humid day with cloudy skies, but there won't be any rain in the earlier part of the day. Now let's hear from Joan Zane for more weather news for the Tampa Bay area. A restaurant kitchen. Hurry up, chef! I have twelve customers and they all want today's special. Some of them have been waiting for fifteen minutes. They're getting upset. I know, I know, but I only have two hands. You'll have to help me. Help you? That's not my job. I'm a waitress, not a cook. 
Well, one of my assistants is off today and the other is out sick. Oh, okay. What do I do first? Well, start putting the meat on the plates and I'll finish these vegetables. Okay. Is that enough meat? Mm, that's a little too much. Take some off. What about potatoes? Oh, put on plenty of potatoes. They're cheap. And lots of peas. All right. Can I take them out now? Have you put the gravy on yet? Huh? Oh, no, I haven't. Where is it? Here it is. Oh, there isn't enough gravy. There's plenty in that pot over there. Where? Oh, okay. I've got it. Fine. Now you can begin taking the plates out to the customers. Whew, they're hot. Well, use a dish towel. And don't carry too many plates. You might drop them. Oh, I won't drop them. I've never dropped a plate in my life. Asking for directions. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. I have an appointment with Mrs. Bedoya, the sales manager. What time is your appointment? 11.30. Okay. You're Ms. O'Hare, aren't you? Yes, that's right. Take the elevator to the third floor. Go down the hall to the left. Mrs. Bedoya's office is the third door on the right. You can't miss it. Thank you. Don't bother to knock. Just go right in. She's expecting you. Excuse me. Yes? I'm lost. Is this the way to Disney World? Well, you can get there this way, but it's not the quickest route. Oh, no. Well, can you tell me the best route? Sure. Turn around and go back to the expressway. Turn left and go on until you get to the interstate. That's the I-4. The I-4? That's right. Turn left on the interstate and follow the signs for Tampa. That's I-4 West. You'll see signs to Disney World after a few miles. It's exit 26. Does this bus go to 50th Street? Yes, it does. Step in, please. What's the fare? A dollar twenty-five. Okay, here's two dollars. Can't you read? Exact change only. Oh, okay. I have five quarters here. Can you tell me when we get to 50th Street? Okay. Thanks a lot. Coast Guard Rescue. This is the KLLN Radio News Desk. It's 5.15. A Coast Guard helicopter is trying to rescue a man who has fallen down a cliff in Point Reyes, about 15 miles north of San Francisco. The man is lying on a small beach at the foot of the cliff. The helicopter has arrived at the scene, and a paramedic has climbed down a ladder to the beach. He's speaking to a doctor on the helicopter by radio. Hello? Can you hear me, doctor? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Is he unconscious? No, he's conscious, but he looks pretty bad. Okay, ask him if he can move. Can you move? No, I... I... Ask him if he's in pain. Are you in pain? Oh, yes, I... Ooh. Ask him where it hurts. Where does it hurt? It's my back. Uh-oh, don't move him. I'm coming down. Bob Atkinson is the editor of The Daily Sun. He's sending a young reporter, Lois Gold, to interview the singer, Duke Williams. Now, I've arranged an interview for four o'clock at his hotel. Ask him lots of questions. You know, ask him if he likes the city, ask him what his next record will be and when he recorded it, and ask him where. Ask him all the usual questions. But don't, don't ask him how old he is, okay? UFO. Dick and Janet were driving along a quiet country road in Ohio. They were on their way to Cincinnati. It was almost midnight. Dick, look over there. There's something in the sky. What is it? I don't know what it is. It's probably a plane. I don't think so. It's too big and too bright. 
You've seen too many movies, Janet. Oh, no. What's the matter? The engine just died. What's happened to it? Well, I don't know what happened. We'll have to find a service station. There's one in the next town. Great, but I don't know if it's open. It's really late. Suddenly, there was a loud noise, and a big, bright silver object flew low over their car. It stopped in midair, turned around, and flew back over their car. Then it went straight up into the sky and disappeared. Wow! What was that? Huh? Don't ask me. I have no idea what it was. Phew. Let's go. We can't. The car won't start. Try it again. That's strange. It's okay now. I wonder why it wasn't working. Do you think it was a UFO? I don't know. I really don't. We should call the police. Do you think they'll believe us? A mugging. One night, Sarah Garcia, an elderly widow, was walking down a dark street in Philadelphia. She was carrying her purse in one hand and a shopping bag in the other. There was nobody else on the street except two young men. They were standing in a dark doorway. One of them was very tall with light hair. The other was short and fat with a beard and mustache. The two men waited for a few seconds and then ran quickly and quietly toward Mrs. Garcia. The tall man held her from behind while the other one tried to snatch her purse. Suddenly, Mrs. Garcia threw the tall one over her shoulder. He crashed into the other man and they both landed on the ground. Without speaking, Mrs. Garcia hit both of them on the head with her purse and walked calmly away. The two surprised young men were still sitting on the ground when Mrs. Garcia crossed the street toward a door with a bright sign above it. Mrs. Garcia paused, turned around, smiled at them, and walked into the Philadelphia Judo Club. Breakfast Blues Adrian! Adrian! What? Adrian, come on, it's almost seven o'clock. Your breakfast's getting cold. All right, I'll be downstairs in a minute. Adrian, you haven't shaved. I know. I'll do it before I go to school. Well, don't forget. And you need a haircut. All right. I'll make an appointment after I finish school. And don't forget, write and thank your grandmother for your birthday present. Yeah, I'll do that when I get time. You'll do it when you get home from school. What about my homework? And I'm going out tonight. You'll do your assignment and write the letter before you go out. Where are you going anyway? Just out. Who with? A friend. Which friend? Just a friend from school. What's her name? Susie. She's in my math class. Well, I'll be out when you get home. You won't go out until your father gets home, will you? He forgot his keys. He left them on the table. Not again. What time will he be home? About 7.15. Why? Oh, no. I'm meeting Susie at 7.30. Well, you'll have to go as soon as he gets home. She'll wait. Will she? You don't know Susie. Hello? Hi, Susie. It's me. I'm sorry. Who? It's me, Adrian. Adrian Roth? Oh, hello, Adrian. What's wrong? It's about tonight. I might be late. I'll have to wait until my dad gets home. He forgot his keys. How late? The movie begins at 8 o'clock. Oh, I'll be there before it begins. He'll be home at 7.15. I'll leave as soon as he gets here. What time will you be there? About 10 to 8. Is that okay? All right, but I'm not going to stand outside the movie theater all night. Don't be later than 8 o'clock or I won't be there. Okay. Susie? Are you still there? Susie?
General Hospital. Maternity unit. Mr. Diaz is in the maternity unit. His wife's going to have a baby. Hello. You're Mr. Diaz, aren't you? Have you been waiting long? Not really. Is there any news? Not yet. We'll tell you as soon as there is. Have you thought of any names for the baby? Oh, yes. If it's a girl, we'll call her Lucia. And if it's a boy, we'll call him Francisco. Operating room. David Foster has had a serious accident. His wife's outside the operating room now. Mrs. Foster, I'm Dr. Yamamura. Oh, doctor, how is he? Well, I'm afraid we'll have to operate. Oh, no. He's always been afraid of operations. Don't worry. If we operate now, he'll be all right. Oh, doctor, do you really have to? I'm afraid so. He's lost a lot of blood. If we don't operate, he'll die. East Wing. Ms. Wright has just arrived at the hospital. She's going to have a minor operation tomorrow. This is your bed, Ms. Wright. Oh, thank you, nurse. Now, get undressed and get into bed. There's a buzzer on the night table. If you press the button, someone will come right away. Oh, I'm sure I won't need anything. Well, don't forget. If you need anything, just press the button. Emergency room. Oh, how did this happen? He was playing soldier and he put the pot over his head. Now it's stuck. Have you tried to get it off? No, I'm afraid of hurting him. Yes, if we pull too hard, we'll hurt him. What are you going to do? Well, if I don't get it off, he won't be able to eat. Oh, no. I'm only joking. If I put some soap on his head, it'll come off easily. On the road. Lee, you can't park here. There's a fire hydrant. Oh, we'll be back in a few minutes. It's okay. Oh, no, it isn't. You'll get a parking ticket if you leave it here. No, I won't. It's 5.30. All the traffic cops have gone home. Oh, Lee. Yes? Is this your car, buddy? May I see your license? Sure. Oh, I left it at home. In that case, you'll have to come with us to the station. But... but why? You were speeding, buddy. But I was only doing 35. There's a 30 mile an hour speed limit. It's a residential section. Really? I didn't see the sign. We've been following you. So, you were doing 35 too? No. We were doing 60 miles an hour, and we couldn't catch you. Hi. I don't know if you can help me. My car's broken down. We have 24-hour service. Where are you? I'm on US 31, just south of Hopeville. My car's just past the Lone Star Cafe. It's a blue Chrysler Baron. Do you know what's wrong with it? I have no idea, but it won't start. I'll send the mechanic out to you. She'll be there in about 15 minutes. Reservations. Glory in Atlanta. Hi, this is Zoot Lambert, the manager of Titanium. You know, the band. I want... Please hold, Mr. Lambert. I'm putting you through to the reservations manager. But... Mr. Lambert, this is Lauren Perry, the hotel manager. Oh, yeah? Well, I need five rooms for Friday night. That's the 15th. I want the best rooms in the hotel. Sorry, I'm afraid I cannot accept your reservation. Now, look, we always stay at the Glory Inn. I know that, sir. Last time you were here, we had a number of complaints from other guests. You mean they don't like long-haired rock musicians? That's not the problem, sir. The band used bad language in the coffee shop and threw two TV sets into the pool. Yeah, yeah. Well, they'll be more careful this time. I'm afraid that's not all, sir. You haven't paid the account for the last time yet. I'll put a check in the mail. Please do. So, what about our reservation for Friday? I'll answer that very simply, sir. No way! Emergency. Dial 911. 
Operator 366. I've just seen two cars crash into an armored truck. I think it's a robbery. Where? Just outside the factory gates. What factory? McManus Forge Company on Old Selma Road. The first police car got to the factory three minutes later, but it was too late. The robbers had gone. They had knocked out one of the security guards and shot the other. Both guards were lying on the ground near the armored truck. The thieves had taken the payroll for the factory. The police called an ambulance for the guards and questioned three people who had seen the robbery. Operator 217. I want to report a fire. Where is it? The Pexico service station on Hudson Street. Come quickly. Yes, a fire engine will be there in a few minutes. The fire engine got to the service station just in time. The convenience store in the station was burning. Fortunately, the fire hadn't reached the gas pumps and hadn't spread to the neighboring buildings. The firefighters were able to put it out quickly. The fire had started in the office. Someone had thrown a lit cigarette into a waste paper basket. Operator 577. There's a boy in the river. I don't think he can swim. I can see him from my window. In the river? Where? Oh, I'm sorry. Near Key Bridge, the Washington end of the bridge. I'll send a paramedic ambulance right away. When the paramedic ambulance got there, the boy was lying on the ground. A police officer had seen the boy in the river and had dived in and rescued him. The boy was all right. The police officer had given him artificial respiration. The ambulance took the boy and the police officer to the hospital. Embarrassing Experiences Readers' Letters Oh, no! Have you ever had an embarrassing experience? Who hasn't? Last week, we asked our readers to tell us about their embarrassing experiences. We received hundreds of letters. Here is a selection. A smart teacher. My most embarrassing experience happened when I had just finished college. I had just started teaching at a high school in Denver. One morning, my alarm clock didn't go off. I had forgotten to set it. I woke up at 8 o'clock, and school started at 8.30. Quickly, I washed, shaved, dressed, jumped in my car, and drove to school. When I got there, classes had already started. I didn't go to the office or the teacher's room, but went straight into my first period class. After two or three minutes, the students started laughing, and I couldn't understand why. Suddenly, I looked down and understood. I had put on one black shoe and one brown shoe. Stanley Morris, Boulder, Colorado. Hand in Hand The most embarrassing experience I've ever had happened two years ago. My wife and I had driven into New York to do some shopping. The streets were very crowded and we were holding hands. Suddenly, my wife saw a dress she liked in a store window and stopped. I started looking at some radios in the next window. After a minute or two, I reached for my wife's hand. There was a loud scream, and a woman slapped my face. I hadn't taken my wife's hand. I had taken the hand of a complete stranger. Gary Hall, Paramus, New Jersey. A parking problem. My husband and I had decided to buy a new house, and I'd made an appointment to see our bank manager. I'd never met him before, and I was a little nervous. I drove into town, and I was lucky enough to find a parking space outside the bank. I just started backing into the space when another car drove into it. I was furious. I opened my window and shouted at the other driver. He ignored me and walked away. It took me 20 minutes to find another space. As soon as I had parked the car, I rushed back to the bank. I was 10 minutes late for my appointment. 
I went to the manager's office, knocked, and walked in. The manager was sitting behind his desk. He was the man who had taken my parking space. Margaret Larcade, San Antonio, Texas. A Ghost Story Doug and Kay are staying in an old house on Cape Cod. It belongs to Doug's uncle, and they've borrowed it for the weekend. They arrived an hour or two ago, and they're sitting in front of a fire in the living room downstairs. Oh, Doug, this house is fantastic. I love old houses. There's a ghost here, you know. Doug, don't be silly. Are you trying to scare me? No, I've been coming here for years. We used to stay here when I was a kid. I saw the ghost myself once. This isn't funny, Doug, and I don't believe in ghosts. You don't? Well, I do. Where did you see the ghost? Upstairs, in the bedroom. Yeah, right. Did it have a white sheet over its head? No, no. It was just an ordinary ghost. He was wearing clothes from the 1800s. He? Who? The ghost. I'll tell you about it. I'd been out walking all day, and I was really tired, so I went to bed early. Had you been reading a book about ghosts? No, no. Well, go on. What happened? I'd been in bed for two or three hours. How did you know that it was a few hours? There's an old grandfather clock in the bedroom. You'll see it when we go upstairs. Anyway, the ghost was standing beside it. What did you do? Nothing. What did he say? Nothing. He just stared at me. How did he get into the room? Hadn't you locked the door? Yes, I had. And the window, too. It was a cold, foggy night like tonight. Was there a fireplace? Yes, but it was too small for a man to get down. Anyway, there'd been a fire. What did you do? I sat up and stared back at him. I was too shocked to move. Well, what happened? I don't know how long we've been staring at each other, when suddenly I shouted, and he disappeared. I don't believe it. I didn't believe it myself at the time, but when I told some people who live around here, they believed me. Some of them had seen the ghost themselves. They could even describe him. If you ask them, they'll tell you. Doug, put some more wood on the fire. I'm going to sleep right here tonight. Buying a present. In a record store. Hey, excuse me. I'm trying to find Rat Run Rat by Please Be Funky. It's their latest single. Oh, right. It's number nine this week. CD or cassette? CD. It's right here. Thanks. And do you have the new album by Titanium yet? Heavy Metal Murder? Oh, sure, we have that. It's great. You'll love it. Oh, it's not for me. It's for my grandmother. It's a birthday present. In a jewelry store. I'm trying to find a Christmas present for my wife. Okay. What kind of thing are you looking for? I'm not sure, really. Maybe you can help me. How about a bracelet? No, I bought her a bracelet for our anniversary. Maybe a ring, then. These rings are made of 22 karat gold. Hmm. What kind of stone is that? A diamond. And it's less than $5,000. Oh. Well, maybe you could show me some earrings, then. In a toy store. Do you need any assistance, ma'am? Thank you. Yes, I'm looking for a toy for my nephew. Okay. How old is he? He'll be nine on Saturday. What about a skateboard? No, I don't want him to hurt himself. How about a drum set? I don't think so. His father will be upset if I buy him one of those. Do you have anything educational? You see, he's a very intelligent boy. I have the perfect thing. A do-it-yourself computer kit. Where is it made? Good evening. I'm Jesse Carson. Welcome to Double Your Cash. 
Our first contestant tonight is Dawn Sikorsky from Lincoln, Nebraska. How are you doing, Dawn? I'm doing fine, Jesse. What do you do, Dawn? I'm a librarian. And were you born in Lincoln? No, I wasn't. I was born in Omaha. Okay. Now the first question is for one hundred dollars. Are you ready? Sure. Where are Ferrari cars made? Are they made in Spain? Are they made in France? Or are they made in Italy? That's easy. Italy. Correct. That's great, Don. Okay, Don. You can take the one hundred dollars right now, or you can have another question and double your cash. I'll take another question. Okay. This is for two hundred dollars. When was Martin Luther King Jr. murdered? Was it in 1963, 1965, or 1968? He was murdered in 19. A real bargain. Donna Wu is looking for a new house. She's with the realtor now. Well, Ms. Wu, this is the house that I told you about, 341 Sun Lake Drive. The owners are away, but I have the keys. When was it built? It was built in 1936. Who built it? I have no idea. Is it important? No, I guess not. Is that a new roof? It looks new. It's pretty new. It was put on two years ago. It's in very good condition. The previous owner was a builder. I'm worried about the electrical wiring. Has it been rewired? Yes, it has. Oh, when was that done? Five years ago. It's been completely renovated. New central heating and air conditioning have been put in, and a new garage has been built. Oh, when was that done? The garage? The last year, I think. It's a very solid house. It's built of brick with a tiled roof. I have a little boy in elementary school. Does a school bus pass by here? Yes, right here on Sun Lake Drive. The children are picked up at eight o'clock, and they're brought home by three thirty. It's really not expensive. I've seen a lot of similar houses, and they're more expensive. Oh yes, it's a real bargain. Are there any plans for new construction in this area? Excuse me. New construction? Well, uh, yes, a new hospital is going to be built about six blocks north of here. Anything else? Well. A new interstate highway will be built next year. You'll be able to get to the city in half the time. Where exactly will the interstate be built? Ah,、uh, it'll be built just down the street. Sunlight Drive has been chosen as the main exit for the city. It'll be interesting. You'll be able to watch the traffic. The six o'clock report. Silvernail with the six o'clock report from WBTV Baltimore. Our top story tonight: Alan Wolf, the great plane robber, has been caught in Costa Rica. He was arrested in a San Jose nightclub. He is being questioned at local police headquarters, and he will probably be sent back here to Baltimore. In 1992, Wolf was sentenced to 40 years in prison for his part in the great plane robbery at Baltimore Washington International Airport. He escaped from the Maryland State Penitentiary in April. Since then, he has been seen in ten different countries. Another tragedy in the music world: Jerry Henderson, the lead guitarist of the rock group The Rats, is dead. He was found unconscious in his room at the Baltimore Glory Inn early this morning. Henderson was rushed to the Johns Hopkins University Hospital, but doctors were unable to save his life. A number of bottles, which had been found in his room, were taken away by the police. The painting "Iris Morning" by Penoir was stolen last night from the Baltimore Museum of Art. The painting, which is worth over five million dollars, had been given to the museum in 1993. It hasn't been found yet, and all area airports, highways, and train stations are being watched. All vans and trucks are being searched. A reward of fifty thousand dollars has been offered for information. 
And finally, Jumbo, the elephant that escaped from the Baltimore Zoo this afternoon, has been caught. Jumbo was chased across Druid Hills Park and was finally captured at a hot dog stand near the park's main gate. Jumbo had not been fed and was trying to take bread rolls from the stand. A tranquilizer gun was used and Jumbo was loaded onto a truck and was taken back to the zoo. At the zoo, he was examined by the zoo veterinarian. Fortunately, no damage had been done and Jumbo will be returned to the elephant house tomorrow. The Sunday Magazine Last night I went to see the new musical at the Lewis and Clark Memorial Theater. It's called Space Opera and was written by Tim Weber with music by Andrew Rice. It was a highly entertaining evening and the audience enjoyed every minute of it. The music was performed by the Idaho Symphony Orchestra and it is really great. The hero is played by soap opera star Danny Clean and he sings most of the best songs. However, the most popular song in the show is Starlight Tonight, and I'm sure it'll be a big hit. It's sung by Lorna Winter, who plays the Queen of Jupiter. Her costumes are sensational. They were designed by Annette Field. One dress cost more than $20,000. There is a CD of the show available on the Polyglot label, and an illustrated book which is published by Apple Tree Books. Take my advice. Go see it. Elvis Presley, Story of a Superstar. When Elvis Presley died on August 16, 1977, radio and television programs all over the world were interrupted to give the news of his death. President Carter said, Elvis Presley changed the face of American popular culture. He was unique and irreplaceable. 80,000 people attended his funeral, and Elvis Presley movies were shown on television, and his records were played on the radio all day. In the year after his death, 100 million Presley albums were sold. Elvis Presley was born on January 8, 1935, in Tupelo, Mississippi. His twin brother died at birth. His parents were very poor, and Elvis never had music lessons. But Elvis regularly sang at church services. In 1948, when he was 13, his family moved to Memphis, Tennessee. Elvis left school in 1953 and got a job as a truck driver. In the summer of 1953, Elvis paid four dollars and recorded two songs for his mother's birthday at Sun Records studio. Sam Phillips, the owner, heard Elvis and asked him to record That's All Right in July 1954. 20,000 copies were sold, mainly in and around Memphis. Elvis made five more records for Sun, and in July 1955 he met Colonel Tom Parker, who became his manager. Parker sold Elvis's contract to RCA Records. Elvis immediately bought a pink Cadillac for his mother. In January 1956, Elvis recorded Heartbreak Hotel, and a million copies were sold. In the next 14 months, he made another 14 records, and they were all big hits. In 1956, he also made his first movie in Hollywood, Love Me Tender. In March 1958, Elvis had to join the army. When his hair was cut, thousands of women cried. He spent the next two years in Germany, where he met Priscilla Ballou, who became his wife eight years later in 1967. In 1960, he left the army and went to Hollywood, where he made several movies during the next few years. Most critics thought the movies were a waste of his talent. By 1968, many people had become tired of Elvis. He hadn't performed live since 1960. But then he recorded a new album from Elvis in Memphis and appeared in a TV special. 
he became popular again and went to Las Vegas, where he was paid $750,000 for four weeks. In 1972, Priscilla left him, and they were divorced in October 1973. The next few years were spent doing concert tours. Elvis died at home of a heart attack. He had been eating and drinking too much for several years. He left all his money to his only daughter, Lisa Marie Presley. Since his death, Elvis has sold more records than during his lifetime. He has become a legendary figure, and every year there are rumors that he is still alive. In 1993, Elvis was the first rock musician to be featured on a U.S. postage stamp. People were asked to vote. Did they want a picture of the young 1956 Elvis or of the Elvis of the Las Vegas shows? You can see how they voted. Classifieds Andy I have $6,000. I'm going to look at the car. If I like it, I'll buy it. Barbara. That's a nice car, but I don't have enough money. If I had enough money, I'd buy it. Chris. I've worked for an oil company for 10 years. I have a BS in engineering. I have the qualifications. I'm going to apply for the job. If they offer me the job, I'll definitely take it. Dave. I like that job, but I can't apply for it. I don't have the qualifications. If I had the qualifications, I'd apply for it. Floyd. I'm a mechanic, and I know a lot about cars. I have a current driver's license and enough money. If they ask me, I'll go with them. Tom. I have $4,000 and a current driver's license but I know very little about cars. If I knew something about cars, I'd go with them. Jessica. I am a native speaker of English. I can read and write Spanish. I'll apply for the job. If I get it, I'll have to move to New Jersey. Helen. I am a native speaker of English, but I can't read or write Spanish. If I could read and write Spanish, I would apply for the job. Darlene. I'm 19 and I'm interested in the job. I'll get more information if I call. If the salary's good, I'll apply. Jack. I'm interested in the job, but I'm too young. I'm only 17. If I were older, I'd apply. Eating out. Are you hungry? Yeah, I didn't have much for breakfast. Do you feel like a hamburger? Okay, I'll have a big Greg, but no fries for me. Anything to drink? You've been here before. What are the shakes like? Not bad. I'm getting one. Okay, I'll have a strawberry shake. Anything else? No, that's all. Next. One big Greg, one cheese Greg, one order of fries. Large or regular? Large, and two strawberry shakes. Is that it? Uh-huh. That's all. What are you having? I don't know. I can't decide. I'd have the special if I were you. I had it last time I was here. It was great. No, it's got ham on it. I don't like ham. I'll just have the plain pizza. A regular or a large? Hmm. A large, I think. Are you very hungry? No, not very. Then I wouldn't have a large one if I were you. They're enormous. What about an appetizer? Okay, let's have another look at the menu. Hi, I'm Adam and I'm your waiter today. Are you ready to order yet? Yes, please. We'd like a plain pizza and a Pizza Palace special. Would you like regular or large pizzas? Both regular, please. Anything to start? Yes, a soup and a house salad, please. Sure. It'll take just a couple of minutes. What time is it, Roy? 20 after 1. We don't have much time. Where do you want to eat? Pizza Palace? McGregor's? A pizza would be okay if we had more time, but we don't. And I don't really feel like a burger. 
Why don't we just grab a sandwich? Okay, there's a deli just around the corner. Fine, let's try it. Hello there, hon. What can I get for you? One tuna sandwich and one vegetarian, please. Will that be white, whole wheat, rye bread, or a roll? Whole wheat. Will there be any drinks with that, hon? One coffee, one hot tea. Is that everything? Yeah, that's it. Offshore Oil On tonight's edition of Mississippi Magazine, we'll look at offshore oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Oil was first discovered in the Gulf of Mexico in the 1930s. Since then, more oil has been found off the coasts of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. More money is being brought into the state of Mississippi from offshore drilling leases. We aren't going to become very rich, but we must decide how to spend the revenue from oil. We took our TV cameras into the streets to ask people their opinion. Our question was, if you were the governor of Mississippi, what would you do with the money? Well, of course I'm not the governor, but if I were, I'd spend the money on more hospitals and schools. We need more doctors, nurses, and teachers. We don't have enough good teachers. If salaries were higher, we could keep better teachers. And there aren't enough doctors and nurses either because the medical schools are too small. If they were bigger, we would have more doctors and nurses. Money that is spent now on education and health is an investment for the future. I think the answer is simple. Taxes are too high in this country. I would reduce state taxes. If we reduce taxes, people would have more money. If they had more money, they'd spend more. Industry would have to produce more, so it would need more workers. There would be more jobs, and we would all be richer. I'm very worried about the economy. There aren't enough jobs for everyone, and people with jobs aren't making enough money. If I were governor, I'd help low-income families pay their heating and electric bills. I'd encourage farmers to produce more food more cheaply. I'd bring more industry into the state. If we did that, everybody would benefit, wouldn't they? There's one thing that makes me happy. I'm glad the money stays in Mississippi. The federal government would spend it on more tanks and bombs. There's too much crime and violence nowadays. There aren't enough police officers on the streets. I'd give cities money to increase the size of their police forces, and I'd raise their salaries. If we had more police officers, we'd all feel safer, and I'd increase the benefits for senior citizens. I've worked hard all my life, and I should have a reasonable standard of living. Far Trek These are the voyages of the Starship Interface, its 50-year mission, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Nothing's happened for years. I'm bored. Captain Kurt, there's a planet on the screen. Look! What's that, Mr. Sudo? It looks like a Krinklon spaceship. The planet will be destroyed. The Krinklons destroy everything. They must be stopped. What are we going to do, Mr. Schlock? You know Starfleet regulations, Captain. We can observe, but we cannot interfere. Nothing can be done. Pictures from the planet's surface are being received now, Captain. The Krinklons are preparing an attack, Captain. Well, something has to be done. We're going down there. Schlock, Uhulu, come with me. You shouldn't go, Captain. You might be killed. But where are the people? This doesn't look like the same place. At last, Captain Kurt. I have tricked you. I cannot be beaten. You and all your crew will be killed. I will fight you. But let my crew go. Where did the Krinklon go? What happened? 
Nothing happened, Captain. You were bored. You needed to be entertained. We turned on the artificial reality machine. It was all a dream. Reports Lynn Willis is a new reporter for the Los Angeles Daily Echo. Last week, several famous people arrived at L.A. International Airport, and Lynn was sent to interview them. Nobody told her very much. Cristina del Castillo Secretary General of the United Nations I'm very busy. I have a lot of appointments. I can't say very much. I'm happy to be in Los Angeles. I enjoyed my visit in January. I'll be here for only 12 hours. I'm going to meet the governor. I have no other comments. Lynn's report. Christina Del Castillo visited California yesterday. She arrived at 10 a.m. and we asked her to comment on the international situation. She just made a brief statement. She said that she was very busy and that she had a lot of appointments. She said she couldn't say very much, but she said that she was happy to be here and that she had enjoyed her visit in January. She said she would be here for only 12 hours and that she was going to meet the governor. She said she had no other comments. Ivan Neistat, European movie director. I like newspaper reporters, but I don't have time to say much. Just that I'm working at Global Studios in Hollywood. I haven't worked in Hollywood before. I've heard bad things about Hollywood movies in the past, but I can work with the people at Global. It's the best studio in the world, and I'm the greatest director in the world. My new movie will cost $80 million. Lynn's Report Academy Award winner Ivan Neistat arrived in L.A. yesterday. Ivan was in a hurry. He said he liked newspaper reporters, but that he didn't have time to say much. He said that he was working at Global Studios in Hollywood. Ivan said that he hadn't worked in Hollywood before, and that he had heard bad things about Hollywood movies in the past. He said that he could work with the people at Global. He said that it was the best studio in the world, and that he was the greatest director. He also said that his new movie would cost $80 million. Oral exams. Hey, Marta, have you finished the exam? Yes, I have. Whew. Was it hard? Well, yes, it was pretty hard. Did you pass? I don't know. Ms. Nadler didn't tell me. What questions did she ask? First, she asked me what my name was. That was pretty easy, wasn't it? Yes, except I couldn't remember. Then she asked me where I came from and how long I'd been studying here at the Institute. And what else did she ask? She asked when I had begun taking English, and she asked how I would use English in the future. Yes, yes, go on. Then she asked me if I liked the Institute and if I lived with my parents. Anything else? I'm trying to remember, Stefan. Oh, yes, she asked if I spoke any other languages. Is that all? Let's see. Well, she asked me what my hobbies were, and she asked me to tell her about them. Then she gave me a picture and asked me to describe it. Then I was asked to read a passage out loud. What did she say at the end? Oh, yes. She asked me to tell you to go in right away. But you said... Hello, can I help you? I'm interested in your St. Cuthbert vacation package. Oh, yes, the Caribbean. I can recommend it highly. Can you tell me a little more about it? Of course. It's a terrific package tour. You'll travel on a regularly scheduled flight. You'll be met at the airport and taken to your hotel. The hotel has a swimming pool and a great nightclub. It's a very modern resort. It was built last year. The restaurant is wonderful, and you can walk to the beach in two minutes. It sounds great. I'd like to make a reservation. Just a minute, and I'll get the form to fill out. Marion made the reservation and paid a deposit. Two months later, she was in St. Cuthbert. But she was disappointed. When she got home to Chicago, she went to see the travel agent. Hello, 
again. Did you have a good trip? No, I certainly did not have a good trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What was wrong? Well, when I got to St. Cuthbert, I had to spend four hours at the airport. You said we would be met, but we weren't. You also said we would be taken to the hotel. We weren't, and the taxi cost fifty dollars. I see. You had a very bad start. But the hotel was nice, wasn't it? No, it was not. You said it was modern. You were so right. They hadn't finished building it. We couldn't sleep because the construction workers were working all night on our balcony. You said it had a swimming pool, and it did, but it was empty. And the restaurant. They served canned tuna fish every night. Tuna and rice. Tuna salad. Tuna and spaghetti. Oh no! You said that the hotel was near the beach. You said we could walk there in two minutes. Couldn't you? Sure, but there was one problem. There was an oil refinery between the hotel and the beach, and it took half an hour to walk around it. Oh no! I'm really sorry. We didn't know. We really can't give you a refund. But we can give you a ten percent discount on your next vacation. Next vacation? I'm spending my next vacation right here in Chicago. Having things done. I'm sorry I'm late. I couldn't get the car started this morning. Winter's almost here. The engine was probably cold. It needs a complete tune-up. But garages are so expensive nowadays. Can't you do it yourself? Who? Me? I don't know anything about cars. Well, if I were you, I'd have it done soon. The garage that I use is very reasonable, and have the radiator filled with antifreeze. They say it's going to be a cold winter. Hi. Do you do alterations? Yes, we do. What do you want done? I'd like to have this skirt lengthened. It's too short for me. Fine. It'll take about two weeks. And at the same time, I want to have this dress shortened. It's a little too long. Okay. Would you mind putting on the skirt first? You can change in there. Hello. Can I make an appointment to see the optometrist? Sure. Would next Friday be okay? At three o'clock? Do you have an earlier appointment? No, I'm sorry. That's the earliest. Well, that'll be okay then. I want to have my eyes tested. I think I need new glasses. Bye. Bye. Oh, be careful. That isn't the door. It's a window. What? Oh yes, it is a window. Do you see my problem? Supermarket shock. Picture one. Michelle went to the supermarket last Saturday. While she was shopping, she met her neighbor David. David was with his three-year-old son Joshua. Picture two. While they were talking, Joshua got bored. He began playing with some jars of coffee. He took a jar from the shelf. It was very heavy. He put the jar into Michelle's shopping bag. She didn't notice. Picture three. As Michelle was leaving the supermarket. A store detective stopped her. She took the jar of coffee from Michelle's bag. Picture four. The manager was very angry. There had been a lot of trouble with shoplifters recently. I'm sorry, but I have to call the police. Oh no! It's all a terrible mistake. Now I remember. I was talking to my neighbor. His name is David. David Samuels. Anyway, his little boy Joshua was with him. You see, Josh was playing with some jars of coffee. He was bored, I guess. David asked him what he was doing. I remember. Then I left them and I did the rest of my shopping. I paid for my groceries and went out into the parking lot. The store detective stopped me there. That's it. Josh put the coffee in my bag. I'm sure that's the answer. I'm sorry. I really don't believe you. Michelle, the cashier told me you were in here. I've just been speaking with Josh. He said that he put a jar in your bag. Who are you? I'm Michelle's neighbor. Look, I can explain everything. The appointment. Once upon a time, there was a rich caliph in Baghdad. 
He was very famous because he was wise and kind. One morning, he sent his servant Abdul to the market to buy some fruit. As Abdul was walking through the market, he suddenly felt very cold. He knew that somebody was behind him. He turned around and saw a tall man dressed in black. He couldn't see the man's face, only his eyes. The man was staring at him, and Abdul began to shiver. Who are you? What do you want? Abdul asked. The man in black didn't reply. What's your name? Abdul asked nervously. I am death, the stranger replied coldly and turned away. Abdul dropped his basket and ran all the way back to the caliph's house. He rushed into the caliph's room. Excuse me, master. I have to leave Baghdad immediately, Abdul said. But why? What's happened? the caliph asked. I just met death in the market, Abdul replied. Are you sure? asked the caliph. Yes, I'm sure. He was dressed in black and he stared at me. I'm going to my father's house in Samara. If I go at once, I'll be there before sunset. The caliph could see that Abdul was terrified and gave him permission to go to Samara. The caliph was puzzled. He was fond of Abdul, and he was angry because Abdul had been badly frightened by the stranger in the market. He decided to go to the market and investigate. When he found the man in black, he spoke to him angrily. Why did you frighten my servant? Who is your servant? the stranger replied. His name is Abdul, answered the caliph. I didn't want to frighten him. I was just surprised to see him in Baghdad. Why were you surprised? the caliph asked. I was surprised because I have an appointment with him tonight in Samarra. <laughs>